So hello everybody, very nice to see you all. This is the first of two online sessions for the British Animal Studies Network uh, this year, 2023. In the last meeting we had, which was the first one we had back from uh, the lockdown, everybody seemed very excited by the idea that we might have a session that kind of did an overview of things that have been happening in the field um, of animal studies. So I'm hoping we're not going to be too solipsistic here, but I think it is important for us to really get a sense of the range of approaches. And I hope today we've got three really different approaches to this. So our first speaker is uh, Shonali Kakaul, who's at JNU in the New Delhi. Um, she is a cultural and intellectual historian of early India, specialising in working with Sanskrit literature. She's professor at the Centre for Historical Studies at JNU and has also been the Malathi Singh Distinguished Lecturer in South Asian Studies at Yale, the Jangonda Fellow in Indology at Leiden and the DAAD Professor of History at the South Asia Institute in Heidelberg. She's authored Making of Early Kashmir, Imagining the Urban, uh, Retelling Time and Eloquent Spaces and a cultural history of early South Asia reader. Translations by her include Looking Within Life Lessons from Lal Dead and Hitopadesha from uh, Adelph Press in 2022. Uh, Shanalika, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us from India. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Erika. Uh, namaskar and a very good evening to everyone. I will get started immediately. We don't have too much time on hand today. My paper explores the representation of animals in a seminal dedicated textual tradition from early India in Sanskrit, best identified with the influential second century Panchatantra and its later retelling, the ninth century Hitopadesha. I will today be focusing only on the Hitopadesha given that time is short. This epigrammatic text, the Hitopadesha, peopled by a large number of birds and animals, belonged to a major genre of pre-modern Indian thought known as Niti. Niti was the knowledge and art, if you like, of prudent conduct. So my paper will delve into this tradition to illuminate the mutually constituted fields, as it were, of animal history, and Sanskrit literary production. In particular, it argues for the instrumentality of animals in political, aesthetic, and ethical culture in early India. Literally meaning good advice, the frame story of the Hitopadesha is a king's need to educate his lazy and worthless princes in statesmanship, warfare, and in worldly wisdom more generally. Here is where you begin to glimpse the consciously appointed role of animal stories in elaborating political and strategic instruction. So it's not quite a combination you would expect. A pandit, Vishnu Sharma by name, brings home to the uninitiated princes the subtle teachings of prudent politics. The text disseminates this didactic knowledge in the form of illustrative stories and maxims involving the lives of humans and more prominently, birds and animals. So that's roughly what the text is about. This happens over four books. So there are four sections to the text. The first is titled Mitra Labha, Winning Friends, starring a tortoise, a crow, deer and mouse. The second is Suhrida Bheda, Losing Friends, which revolves around a bull, a lion, and a couple of jackals. Third chapter is called Vigraha, Waging War. And the fourth is called Sandhi, Brokering Peace. So these last two books, the Waging War and Brokering Peace, are actually set amidst the avian world of swans, ducks, peacocks, and so on. That's how the text works. Now, the reference to political and strategic thought in the section titles is, I hope, easy to see. Making allies, sowing dissension, fighting battles, 
and suing for peace. And that is indeed the overt project of the Hitopdesh, which is to teach politics. But then, is the presence of animals in this work merely by way of allegory, where animal life is but a metaphor for human life and concerns? This is typically what fables are supposed to be, and scholars of the Panchatantra Hitopdesh tradition have also believed that that is what is going on here. However, I argue that the Hitopadesha tales are also materially and not only metaphorically human animal stories, yielding a sense of animals as animals and their experiential realities. A large number of non-humans figure in these lively stories, but also significantly humans. So these are not stories only of animals, but of animals and humans both, such as kings and their ministers, husbands and their wives, wives and their lovers, masters and servants, ascetics, householders, and so on. The Hitopdesh thus represents what I call a multi-species genre not a purely phantasmagorical world of marvelous talking birds and animals, no, but a very real world of real humans and animals, where the attribution of speech to the animals, anthropomorphism if you like, does not take away from their reality, but is in fact a heuristic conduit for it. And I will show you why I say that. So literature putting words in animals' mouths is not quite to say that such words cannot be true to animals themselves. As Susan McHugh puts it, the animal story is a human story, but it is also an animal story. Point number two about the Hitopdesh. The numerous sub-stories that constitute the text install birds and animals as not just characters, but narrators, even of human stories inaugurating thereby a very striking literary agency of the animal. And this is not something that's ever been noticed about this text. Moreover, where the non-human narrators break their story to bring in human tales, the pattern of the fable is, please note, effectively reversed. Because here humans are introduced to exemplify the lesson that animals are trying to impress on each other and not the other way around. So there is something more complex than simply the descriptor of fable will convey for the text. Point number three, the joint human animal narrative space, I believe, stirs up the conventional modus operandi of a didactic work by creating, together with the use of humor and satire, an overt, lightness and childlike quality of literary treatment that enables the project of the nomic text. And what is that project? To show us how to live with ideals in a less than ideal world. And I'll be showing you how this will be true. So though didactic, the Hitopdesh is highly realist literature depicting contradictions, complexities and ironies of the lived world, whether human or animal, and not idealized stereotypes or caricatures where animals are only standing in for humans. That's not what's happening in these texts, I believe. The didacticism of the Hitopdesh is paradoxically an irreverent and unorthodox project to which animals are central. I have hence christened this in my book, The Antinomian Didactic. It is therefore not a moralizing subjection, and I'm quoting here, uh, no, no less than Jacques Derrida. It is not a moralizing subjection or a domestication of non-human species for the purpose of asserting human values and hierarchies, which is what Derrida actually feared that fables are all about. Far from being conservative and reproducing social hierarchies, this text from early India could be antinomian and transgressive. It destabilized and problematized figures of power and human ideals and behavior 
rather than sought to reinstate them. This is a big difference from how fable is usually defined as moral tales. The Hitopdesh, for all its didacticism, is not some sanctimonious moral fable, but a complex and wry take on social reality. Which is why, even in a story commissioned by the royalty, so a king has this text composed, even in such a story, the king as character is routinely shown as not only unwise, but also dependent and a risky liability. The Brahmin, which is, who is at the head of the social ritual order, is also parodied as pretentious and wily. In a text authored, mind you, by a Brahmin, indicating thereby a fairly sagacious capacity for self-satire in Sanskrit. And then, sensationally, women are represented in very transgressive tones. They are shown as highly libidinous and resourceful characters who go after what they want despite social censure, such as indulging in extramarital or premarital affairs. For example, the adultery tale in book one of this text, uh, which the crow narrates. In this story, the text unabashedly declares, and I'm quoting in translation, women have twice the appetite of men, four times their brains, six times their courage, and eight times their libido. Aged men are hardly virile. Their wives are taken with other men and regard the husband as a necessary evil, just like medicine. While living beings lust for life and wealth, aged man desires a young wife more than life itself. An old man can neither enjoy sense pleasures nor renounce them. He is like an old toothless dog who cannot chew the bone but helplessly licks at it." Unquote. Note the invocation of a real animal condition of geriatrism to mock its human variant, right? In any case, strong social satire is seen here, confounding ethical subjectivity. And this is underwritten by an important practical observation about life. That is to contrast the ideal with the real and the sacred with the profane. Since the world where people must act was both real and profane, now, how is all this relevant to animals? Taking this further, the Hitoptesh appears as something of a survival guide for the innocent, the good, and the weak, a constituency that the text invokes often and which is, crucially, a trans-species constituency, which is to say the animal world is as vulnerable as the human, if not more. They are perhaps the ultimate subalterns. And the Hitoptesh attempts to educate precisely the vulnerable and the subaltern. On what? On how to make it in an unequal world using nothing but the power of intellect. No matter how much more mighty the villainous enemy, the Hitoptesh's ringing call is Matirev Balad Gariyasi, which is to say, the mind is superior to might. Also phrased as upayen hi yachakyam na tachakyam parakrame. Or strategy can achieve what valor cannot. And these central lessons of the text are seen brilliantly demonstrated by animals, especially those emblematic of frailty and endangerment. And so you have the stories about the sparrow whose nest is washed away by the sea, the crow whose eggs are eaten by the snake, the hare who's offered up as a meal to a lion, rabbits crushed in elephant stampedes, aquatic life dying or migrating the frogs as ponds dry up, the mouse stealing grain from a village hut, the deer caught in a hunter's trap, or even the tiger unable to hunt from old age. These are different stories in this text. 
I hardly need emphasize that these are very actual situations and threats that animals face, the quintessential underdogs in the chain of beings that they are. There is nothing anthropomorphic about this representation, I think you will agree. And in fact, in foregrounding such narrative plots, the Hitopdesh effectively decenters human perception. Animals are also depicted, I will come back to that. Animals are also depicted embodying a host of emotions and mental processes that went along with the struggle for survival. So love, care, fear, hunger, suffering, loss of loved ones, cunning, presence of mind, loyalty, ethical choices of rescuing friends, etc. And all of this, to my mind, exemplifies animal personhood and defies human exceptionalism in favor of a species continuum in the realm of affect. In yet other stories, not only the affective, but the ethical is centrally brought into relation with the animal in the Hitoktesh. Consider the famous story of the loyal mongoose who puts his life at stake in a bloody battle to fight off a snake that would have bitten his master's infant. So this is a pet mongoose and he is left in charge of the master's infant while the master is away. And he, a snake comes along and he fights the snake. This is a famous story, um, uh, transculturally famous, as many of you will recognize. So he kills off this snake and there's a lot of blood lying around. Now his heedless master, when he gets back home, he first sees all the blood and immediately suspects that the mongoose has actually bitten his own child. And so thinking, he beats up the poor pet to death. So even if it is not the explicit purpose of the story, which is to convey the lesson that act with thought and not with haste, even then the animal in the story is clearly shown as superior in emotion and ethics to the human. Or take the story of the washerman's donkey tied up in the yard, braying in desperation to warn his sleeping master of a thief entering the house, only to have the washerman peeved at the noisy disruption, bash up the poor beast to death. Again, it is not the animal who is shown incapable of thought, affect, and common sense, but the human. When you see this assessment, together with the depiction of morally flagrant behavior by men and women that I mentioned earlier, a distinct disturbance of the human affected by the Hitoktesh emerges in clear relief. And this is why I say that the characterization so far of this genre as anthropocentric fables meant to fortify the human needs to be seriously rethought. Is this a fortification going on or a disturbance really, a reconsideration of the human? The same human displacing effect applies to the story of the domesticated bull Sanjeevaka in this text. He is yoked to an ambitious merchant's cart passing through the forest. Along the way, Sanjeevaka stumbles and breaks one leg. And he is promptly abandoned and left to die there by his human master, underlining the latter's ethical equivocality. In a further lesson, the same beleaguered bull is, however, shown willing himself to survive, healing, and going on to lead a life of strength, freedom, and plenty in the forest. So it's actually shown as a blessing in disguise for the bull. This remarkable recovery symbolizes what I would like to believe is a rewilding or a return to nature, which is shown as more nurturing and full of possibilities as compared to the human world. There is in this story, without doubt, an authorial intention to represent the animal as he is himself. His compulsions in the domesticated state, his redemption in nature, but also when the bull is killed eventually by the lion, the perils of a life in the wilderness. 
all of these things are being demonstrated, I believe. So again, we are reminded of how the Hitopesh is not some anthropocentric vision with no place for the true animal as it were. Thus, we can arrive at thriving, and these are just some examples. I have a much larger work on this, um, but, but these should suffice to show that we can arrive at thriving human animal histories in early India, foregrounding both the individuality of non-human animal lives and their interdependence and entanglement with the human, be it in material terms or by jointly partaking of complex, affective, ethical discourses, such as what the Hitopdesh tries to get into. Further, far from a homogenizing human view, the Hitopdesh displays vis-a-vis -vis the non-human world all three capacities of the narrative imagination that philosophers of literature, like Richard Kearney, have identified. And I'm just adapting these to my case. What are these three capacities of literature? One, the testimonial capacity to closely observe and bear witness to experiences of others, in this case, non-humans. Two, the empathic capacity to identify with those experiences of animals as both victims and exemplars. And three, the critical utopian capacity to challenge anthroponormative stories with bionormative ones, which could open up alternative ways of being. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I've already got lots and lots of questions, so that's fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, lots of uh, applause for that. Can I invite Kelsey to step up and start sharing your screen while I introduce you, Kelsey, if that's OK? So our second speaker is Kelsey Granger, who's currently at Ludwig Maximilian University. Um, where she is a Henrietta Hertz Scholar and Alexander von Humboldt Foundation postdoctoral fellow in Munich. She's researching the social significance of horses in early and early medieval China, building on her overarching research interest in the social history of animal keeping in medieval China. Her doctoral project completed at the University of Cambridge in 2022 centered on the phenomenon of lapdog keeping among Tang and Song elites, as well as the practices remarkable Silk Road connections. Related canine research has been published in the Bulletin of SOAS and is forthcoming with the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. Her other key interest, Atypical Women in Medieval China, has involved study of Wu Zaitain's male favorites as published with the late N. Harry Rothschild in the American Review of China Studies and Medieval Female Avenger Tales, as published in the Journal of American Oriental Society. So this talk, as it shows there on the slide, is called China and Pet Studies and Pet Studies in China. So over to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, so I was really inspired by the topic of this year's conference being State of the Field, uh, which prompted me to really examine the sources I'd encountered during my doctoral project on lap dogs in medieval China. And you can see a little lap dog running in this very, very cute painting. Uh, my thesis showed that lap dogs entered China from afar sometime in the seventh century. Remember that date, it's gonna be important. Uh, prompting a zenith of lapdog keeping from the 7th to 10th centuries, which ended with the little lapdogs fall from favour in the 11th and 12th centuries, when pet keeping was monetized and commodified. So introducing my doctoral project inevitably raised eyebrows in Sinology, Chinese studies, uh, but was really embraced in animal studies circles, highlighting the fact that pets remain a rarity in Chinese studies discussions. This is a problem not just for Chinese studies, but also for global histories of pet keeping, hampering our ability to fully understand human animal and more specifically human pet histories. So rather than exploring what pets were in Chinese history and how these practices differed to European examples, I will instead move to a more theoretical plane by examining the secondary literature on Chinese lapdogs that proliferated across the 20th and 21st centuries. 
When I say lap dog, I mostly mean the Pekingese breed specifically. That just tends to be what, what's kind of narrowed down in the modern day. Uh, that's not to say that 7th century lap dogs were Pekingese, though. It's a bit problematic. We'll get into that. So these works can be divided into three categories. We have works by dog fanciers who were keen enthusiasts of all things canine and who laid the foundations for later works on Chinese lap dogs, but at the cost of introducing errors of fact and interpretation. Second are the works by animal studies specialists who don't work primarily on China, which is usefully comparative, but inevitably lacking specialist knowledge. And third are articles by sinologists who have conducted their research without any reference to pet studies. The results are invariably confusing and imprecise. By outlining the incomplete and inaccurate findings of these three groups and approaches, this presentation aims to highlight how early 20th century interpretations of Chinese lapdogs informed by colonialist and orientalist readings continue to plague even modern scholarship on Chinese human pet histories. So the earliest works to grapple with Chinese lapdogs were written by British dog fanciers who began to write breed histories about the Pekingese from the late 1800s. The earliest works on the Pekingese were heavily influenced by colonialism and orientalism during an era in which Britons were brought into closer contact with China than ever before. Trade and conflict with China in the age of empire propelled orientalist narratives and a fascination with all things Chinese. As such, stories of life in the imperial palace, such as those recorded by the American portrait painter Catherine Carl and the putative princess Yuda Ling, were of great interest. Both women recount the decadent lives of Pekingese dogs in the court of Dowager Empress Cixi, a decadence appropriate and appealing during this era of chinoiserie. The fashion for all things Chinese was obviously a much larger cultural phenomenon, but it was neatly tied up in the Pekingese, a dog breed introduced to Britain following the ransacking of the Summer Palace by British forces in 1860. The earliest Pekingese to reach Britain were purportedly stolen from the ransacked Summer Palace, and later acquisitions also involved apparent stealth and duplicity to sneak the dogs away to Britain. The difficulty encountered in acquiring these dogs was used to evidence their status as vaunted imperial treasures. Their value, alongside the simultaneous loss of pre-colonial China's mystique as a result of concurrent Western physical and political force, made the Pekingese a unique souvenir of a lost old China. As Sarah Chiang's 2006 article aptly shows, Pekingese breeders in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were mostly women driven by colonial nostalgia, who authenticated the vaunted status of the Pekingese in China's past via breed histories to then actively inherit the dog's imperial legacy. While this context invariably motivated the production of Pekingese breed histories that appealed to colonial nostalgia, orientalism, and this inheritance of the Pekingese's imperial legacy in the early 20th century, later works continue to write surprisingly similar treaties on these dogs. Even as recently as 2002, works on the Pekingese have yet to shake off the Orientalist and Colonialist readings from the late 19th century. The marked continuity of ideas and references throughout Dog Fancier's works is perhaps understandable given each author's lack of Chinese language training and a pedestrian knowledge of Chinese history and art. Later writers likely relied on their predecessors' scholarship without question because of these methodological challenges. This faith in the scholarship of prior studies, not acknowledging the context in which these breed histories were first produced, means that significant errors have never been fully redressed, with faulty translations, references, and assumptions reprinted again and again without comment or criticism. So here I'll highlight three prevalent assumptions about the Pekingese that are provably false. So first is this assumption that the lineage of the Pekingese dates back to 1000 BC, if not earlier. Notably, but not uniquely, the Pekingese breed was considered to be timeless, with no consideration for how earlier lapdogs may have differed to these contemporary standards. This evidences the late 19th century belief among British dog fanciers that breeds were, if not timeless, then so long established that contemporary standards more or less replicated ancient examples. Breeds were actually a recent invention whose novelty was barely acknowledged by the dog fancy. However, 
the assumption of the antiquity of dog breeds reduces, reproduces very closely the Orientalist assumptions about lack of progress in non-Western societies. The timeless qualities that are attributed to so-called Oriental societies may also contribute to this reading of the Pekingese and other Chinese breeds like the pug as well. The vaunted legacy of the Pekingese as this imperial lapdog was first verified by the hobbyist VWF Collier in 1921 in his Dogs of China and Japan in Nature and Art, wherein he provided several tenuous examples of small or short-faced dogs similar to the modern Pekingese. Collier's time frame, timeline sorry, was built around largely misunderstood textual references, but was subsequently cited by several dog fanciers across the 20 and 21st centuries. Even prior to this 1921 work, Tom, Thomas Douglas Murray in 1909 and M.N. Daniel in 1914 both assumed that the Pekingese had existed in China from time immemorial. The presumed antiquity and consistent imperial patronage of the breed is exemplified by two striking quotes that almost without exception, every emperor had his palace dogs, and that there have been Pekingese dogs in China for around about 4,000 years, and they have hardly changed at all. Both of these statements are demonstrably false. The second is that the Pekingese was a veiled or even an overt way to talk about old China, specifically about wealth, sentimentality, cruelty, and strange otherized behavior following an Orientalist and imperialist reading. Similar comments on China can even be seen in much more recent publications with works continuing to equate cosseted lapdogs with Chinese official or breed standards with, and I quote, true Chinese love of the grotesque. That was from the 1970s. Um, and third is that the Pekingese was descended from the Maltese dogs of the classical world, marking Chinese lapdog keeping as being informed or even derived from Western models. This removes any agency from Chinese pet keeping, rooting it in the cultural knowledge of British dog fanciers. Now we might not expect too much from popular history aimed at dog enthusiasts. Unfortunately, the aforementioned assumptions of the timeless Pekingese, along with associated Orientalist commentary, have made their way into academic works. The lack of proper engagement with China in pet studies has meant that even leading animal study specialists have relied on these subjective efforts. Unlike many non-Western and pre-modern examples of pet keeping, Chinese lapdogs are often included in seminal works on pet studies, though invariably referring to the Pekingese and using 19th century anecdotes. However, the sources used are often enough the dog fanciers that I've just mentioned. So a particularly striking example is the pioneering 1987 article by James Sapel, in which he sought to address the Eurocentric nature of pet theories. Pet keeping in non-Western societies, some popular misconceptions, sought to demonstrate the universal significance of pets, contrary to their perceived frivolity in anthropological studies. In this article, Sabelle argued that pet keeping may have been associated with wealth and affluence, but that it didn't only arise in those contexts. His examples of aristocratic and affluent pet keeping practices include the British courts, the classical world, and Chinese imperial lapdog keeping. It's in many ways unsurprising that he relied solely on the work of Pekingese enthusiast Annie Coth Dixie in his assessment of Chinese pet keeping practices at the expense of her errors. Sapel describes the indulgences the Qing court, which is the last Chinese dynasty ending in 1911, lavished on their Pekingese dogs. The Qing court's apparent use of wet nurses for puppies and their appointment of dog guarding eunuchs are oft repeat. Well, are oft repeated marvels of wealth and taboo in the works of dog fanciers, and through them, many animal study specialists. While I don't have the time available today to illustrate this point more amply, these apparent Qing indulgences were often exaggerated and were unique in scope to the late 19th century. This article was not Sapel's first discussion of Chinese lapdogs. In his 1986 book, In the Company of Animals, he forwarded the Pekingese as a prime example of animals as aristocratic instruments of folly. He remarks that emperors from the Han period onwards displayed an inordinate fondness for dogs, especially the pug-faced ancestors of the modern Pekingese. Again, offering the Pekingese as a timeless and unchanging thread connecting the third century BC, if not earlier, to the 20th century. Details of Qing indulgences of Pekingese dogs are also lifted from the work of Dixie and that of another Briton, Valentine Burkhardt. Again, 
Behaviors ascribed to the Qing period reliant on second, even third hand accounts, which seek to dazzle and scandalize in equal measure, are not only accepted, but also retroactively fitted onto prior dynasties. After describing the lapdog as an aristocratic indulgence, Zappel states that this practice had no impact on how ordinary people viewed dogs. As early as 800 BC, he claims, dogs sparked ambivalence and were solely kept for the purposes of guarding, hunting or consumption. And since then, little has changed except for the virtual disappearance of recognizable hunting breeds. Generalized statements like this exaggerate and oversimplify the broader history of animals in China. Of course, the practices of imperial courts, elites and commoners with regards to lapdogs and dogs more generally was far more dynamic and nuanced than these sweeping comments suggest. Finally, the cultural geographer Yi Fu Tuan makes use of the Pekingese as a key example in his well-known work, Dominance and Affection. Relying exclusively on the works of dog fanciers Dixie, Collier and Godin, Tuan claims that the lap dogs in vogue from the 7th to 10th centuries were either imported Maltese dogs or proto pekingese dogs. Tuan does confess, rightly so, that there is a dearth of evidence between the 9th and 19th centuries during which we know very little about Chinese lap dog keeping. How this dead, dead spot impacts our understanding of lapdog keeping is not explored, however, and the 7th century and the 19th century are nevertheless connected in this and all other works on the subject. Tuan's reliance on the works of dog fanciers and their assertion of this unchanging nature of Chinese society and dog breeds means he neglects to question what we really know about these two periods of pet keeping and what happened in between. In sum, in three seminal works on pet keeping, Sapel and Tuan both relied on the works of dog fanciers alone without citing any Chinese language sources. Sapel inherited assumptions of timelessness, and while Tuan may have questioned the start point of Chinese lap dog keeping, he did not question their classical origin, nor the apparent unchanging nature of pets and people across 10 centuries. The two books in particular are foundational texts for the study of pets. Their theories and frameworks have been the cornerstones for many later studies, and while the two scholars' claims may be questioned or reframed, their inclusion of Chinese lap dogs in Eurocentric and ahistorical theories has yet to be challenged. So what of the Sinologists? Did they too fall under the spell of the dog fanciers theories and more troublingly, the underlying Orientalist narratives surrounding the Pekingese? The short answer is no, but that doesn't mean that Sinology is without its flaws in how it has approached the lap dog. In the 20th century, two Western Sinologists touched on lap dogs in 1909 and 1963. But despite relying on Chinese primary sources, Dog fanciers once again appear as secondary literature, being used to evidence the Maltese origins of the Chinese lapdog. Until the 2010s, few articles had been produced by Chinese scholars on the lapdog, but perhaps thankfully, no dog fanciers appear in the bibliographies. However, that does not mean that the same assumptions have not infiltrated Chinese scholarship. Across these works, the timelessness of the lapdog is rightly questioned, with every study recognizing that there is no evidence for any lapdog in the textual record prior to the 7th century. However, the Maltese origins of the lapdog have not been particularly challenged, and in quoting from the two Western Sinologists who quote from the dog fanciers, the Sinologists are indirectly relying on these same assumptions. The key difference between animal study specialists and the sinologists is how they are engaging with the Chinese lapdog. So Pell and Tuan are discussing the Chinese lapdog to provide evidence for their own pet studies theories. Their reliance on the work of dog fanciers serves to overemphasize the timelessness of Chinese imperial lapdog keeping and to solely focus on the imperial court. Undue emphasis is placed on taboo acts of affection and uh, such as using wet nurses to nurse puppies as contrasted against starker acts of cruelty or indifference towards dogs. These extreme juxtapositions of indulgence and ambivalence distort definitions of pets to the level of a caricature and neglects to mention other social groups who kept lap dogs outside of the imperial family. On the other hand, sinologists mention the lap dog as a curious footnote in Chinese history. Linking these dogs to the Pekingese or the Maltese ties lap dogs to either the modern day or to classical antecedents, failing to fully ground the practice in Chinese periods, peoples or places. Nonetheless, the greatest difference herein is that the sinological works describe the lap dog as an animal rather than recognizing it as a pet. 
The lack of pet studies intervention has meant that from 1909 to the present day, the lapdog in Chinese studies has been viewed as a strange animal rather than a pet. And thus the field has yet to engage with the psychological foundations, societal shifts and redefinitions that allowed for and arose from systematic pet keeping. So having thus presented to you these three categories of research on Chinese lapdogs, each with their own inherited assumptions and ongoing issues, I ought to address the wider question of why should we care about writing an accurate history of Chinese lapdog keeping? In the 21st century, the study of pets is no longer a fringe topic, and the increasingly diverse and interdisciplinary nature of pet studies draws upon historical, sociological and psychological frameworks, as well as the sciences of biology and archaeology. However, the theoretical foundations of pet studies are laid with stones overwhelmingly cut from European quarries. With no significant involvement from sinologists in particular, scholars studying pets rarely extend into East Asia, and when they do, continue to present arguments built on questionable assumptions. The same barriers that prevented later dog fanciers from questioning the works of their predecessors plagues present scholarship, meaning that original lang Chinese language sources or scholarship are rarely, if ever, cited. But there is a more troubling act of omission at play here. By using Chinese examples to evidence key theories regarding pets without the necessary contextualization, these works attempt to obscure the issue of race while simultaneously repeating colonial and orientalist assumptions. In essence, key animal studies theories act as a mouthpiece for dog fanciers, often unwittingly, who wrote on the Pekingese with a very specific aim and lens, and often without any firsthand experience of China. The dog fancy is often repeated examples and anecdotes present taboo acts of affection, lavish wealth or stark indifference to animals. And as Sapel shows, extreme indifference and affection for animals can occur within paragraphs. The inclusion of such sources in an academic work authorizes the mistakes and the racialized statements of the original work. Particularly since the outbreak of coronavirus, anti-Asian sentiment has often centered on how animals are kept and consumed in China. This has been met with entire books attempting to dismantle the notion that cruelty to animals is an inherent part of Chinese culture. Uncritically relying on the works of dog fanciers results in a failure to actively engage with Chinese animal histories and to dismantle these Orientalist informed readings of human animal encounters. More recently, Heidi J. Nast and Philip Howell have commented on the need to advance critical pet studies and global histories of pet keeping. Critical pet studies for NAST means delving into the human pet bond to investigate how what she terms pet love is shaped by socioeconomic context, as well as the impact pet keeping has on human societies and behavior. Howell questions the empirical foundations for present pet studies and calls for the inclusion of non-Western examples to dismantle the Eurocentric bias of animal histories. In response to these two articles, I would add that sinology needs pet studies, just as pet studies need sinology. At present, sinology lacks the tools to fully unpack the lapdog or indeed any pet or companion animal. The impact of pets on Chinese social, economic and environmental histories has yet to be recognized, let alone explored in sinology. Equally, the present failure in pet studies to engage with Chinese primary sources and to question the assumptions of dog fanciers has meant that Chinese pets have been incorrectly assimilated into European frameworks without their proper context. With the proper historical contextualization, one that is reliant on Chinese primary sources informed by solid secondary scholarship, it becomes clear that Chinese lapdog keeping does not necessarily match European examples in the ways that Sapel and Tuan have argued. Divergences and differences can shape our understanding of the Chinese case, but also nuance macro theories of pet keeping. In the case of medieval China, lapdog keeping was just as gendered and feminized as in Victorian Britain and France. The dogs were also sources of erotic potential for male writers to imagine female occupied spaces, though they weren't rivals for the woman's affection. And most uniquely, with the introduction of a pet industry complete with specialist breeders and connoisseur consumers in the 11th century, the lapdog lost out completely. Cats and goldfish could be stratified and bred into many colours and sizes worth differing amounts, but the lapdog could not, and in fact became far less of a discernible pet in this time frame, dropping off the radar completely. The later imperial interest in lapdogs in the 19th century can be considered to be an almost distinct phenomenon, barely connected to this medieval fad that appears to have almost completely died out. These are intriguing snapshots into what could be rewarding conversations between sinology and animal studies. 
Whether written by archaeologists, historians, canine biologists, or dog breeders, the lack of sinological input in pet studies means unchecked and unverified assumptions are too readily accepted and reprinted in both fields. Frustratingly, sinologists and animal studies scholars have alike, until now, relied on the works of dog fanciers despite their issues. With pet keeping being so markedly evident in Chinese sources, there's clearly a need to advance an approach that fully incorporates sinological sources and expertise. Doing so will address, address a significant gap in the fields of sinology and animal studies, providing an example of the kind of interdisciplinarity required for each to gain crucial insights from the other, widening the reach of critical pet studies and beginning to truly write a global history of pets. Thank you. I look forward to your questions and comments. And I really hope I kept that within 20 minutes. Thank you so much. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move swiftly on, uh, lots of applause, to our final talk for today. Um, Lee, if you want to start uploading your screen, that would be fantastic. So uh, this is a joint paper, Angela Bartram, Professor of Contemporary Art at the University of Derby and Lee Digard, is that the correct pronunciation? Yay, um, who's an independent scholar. Angela is an artist and artistic researcher working with artists, objects, sound, video, print, performance, event and published text concerning thresholds of the human body, gallery or museum, definitions of the human and animal as companion species and appropriate strategies for documenting the ephemeral. She's Professor of Contemporary Art and Head of Arts Research and the Digital and Material Artistic Research Centre at the University of Derby. Lee Digard explores the topographies of shared awarenesses, describing a landscape given shape and substance by its animal protagonists, their sensory and imaginative worlds and their autonomy. With language, photography, video installation, event and drawing, her work approaches the animal from positions of equality, collaboration and mutual curiosity and looks at multi-species empathy, animal cognition and personality, sensory processes of memory and grief and the nature of intimacy. Lee is an independent artist and writer based in New Orleans and rural Georgia. Lee, over to you. You're on mute. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Angela Bartram cannot be with us today um, because the ideal version of this presentation is one in which we enact aspects of our collaboration and kind of a shared brain uh, sensibility. So this is adapted from that same mode. Using diverse methods, processes, and materials, and curious to a myriad of potentials, Bartram and Digard explore working as humans from an animal-centric perspective through collaborative artistic research. We bring sensitivities to our handling of the animal as both artistic subject and collaborator to observe and engage with empathy and openness to animal insight and revelation. Our works in performance and video, drawing, printmaking, foreground, animal proximity, species proprioception, reciprocal caretaking, synchronized respiration, and companionate movement. The work of Bartram and Digard regards non-human animals as equals in relation to creative engagement and input. Our work uncovers empathetic awareness and imagination between species, curiosity practiced in reciprocity, and the full expression of animal personalities, initiative, and preferences. It is based in improvisatory exploration and looks closely at play as a crucial component to research, imbuing it with repertory potential. We work collaboratively with non-human animals, we maintain a sense of being together with non-human animals while conducting research. We routinely collaborate with non-human animals within mutual beneficial co-economies of cognition and proprioception. 
our formal collaboration as a creative duo, as Bartram and Digard, was inaugurated in November 2021 when we converged for a joint exhibition in the Tippetts and Eccles Galleries in Logan, Utah. I am a multidisciplinary artist based, as, as Erica said, in New Orleans and rural Georgia with my companion dog, Elvira. I collaborated for 23 years with my horse, Blue, and our relationship was mutually and entirely apart from equestrian activities. I conduct long-term observational and artistic research on domestic and wild animals across the United States, especially in the southeastern United States. Angela Bartram is a researcher and artist based in Nottingham, UK, living with four companion cats and of course, Bartram has explored empathy, politics of inequality with companion animals in artistic research since 2003, when she began collaborating with her dog, Woofer. Bartram and Digard both have, we both have deep and significant experience of animals through long-term relationships with companion species across many different living situations and shared creative endeavors. Individually and collectively, we follow an antithetical position to Cartesian dualism and Rousseau, who asserted in discourse on the origin of inequality, that humans bear a moral responsibility to impose no cruelty on non-human animals exactly due to their inferior status among sentient beings. Artistically, and theoretically, and in opposition to now acknowledged for most misrecognition of non-human animals, we creatively research with non-human animals rather than on them. Our shared ethos is quality-centered and mutually balanced, whereby no human animal is accorded more importance in agency than the other. We aim to know non-human animal companions through respectful and improvisatory engagements based in mutual affinity and empathy. Our shared goal is to understand and learn, to convey and enable these experiences and animal shared insights to others through research. What follows uh, is looking at selected works, ideas, and intentions for this first collaborative show as mentioned in Utah. Um, and within this account is an acknowledgement, contextualization of collaboration, of shared thinking, how this is constructed at a distance from our respective countries, and the dynamic necess necessity for the non-human, uh, my dog Elvira, for this exhibition to bind and connect the project through her investigating physical presence in the gallery and reciprocated empathetic engagement with the two human artists. Empathy and being equal and connected as bodies, irrespective of species derivation is significant. Our collaboration being forged on individual and collective assertions of allowing all to have creative input and agency. The non-human animal, in this case a dog, is not coerced, objectified or subjectified, or reduced to imagistic or bodily material, but is welcomed into a collective and reflexive interspecies collaboration of free agency and cognition. Artists have historically, and in some cases contemporaneously, reduced the living non-human animal to representation alone. Image makers, include the animal only as a codified representational form, which becomes inscribed into the artwork as a body alone. What animals can contribute with their minds beyond being material and stuff is generally ignored. And in such contexts, they function much as with clay, plaster, and other inert making materials, their living sensibility being ignored pernicious assumptions about difference, that one entity is, ob is object and image source, the other is subject and image maker, results in an inevitable downward spiral of essentializing and reduction in addition to the forfeiture of valuable collaborative input. In our collaborative work with animals, we welcome and emphasize constructive, mutually supportive interspecies differences within the operational framework of artistic collaboration. 
And it is possible to, within that to maintain empathetic regard tied to parity, ethical care, and duty. Hal Foster wrote in The Return of the Real that the artist has to take the position of an outsider to be able to observe the world from a position of the ethnographer. They have to partially forfeit their humanity in order to assert and accomplish true observation and critique so that it is in the quote name of the cultural other the committed artist most often struggles. De Deleuze and Guattari explored this notion of the outsider through rhizomatic and multi-entry point experience, locating it with any taking on of a becoming animal as a unique process. Operating within a rhizomatic material and animal sensing practice unites around the struggle to interrogate and subvert orthodox hierarchies, not only intellectually, but also physically and in real time within a cultural setting. So being animal in self-determined roles as artists is to embrace the wild and feral in subtle antagonism to a human-centric world and a semi-negation of its underlying assumptions. So the artist, uh, human in this case, and creative, seeking to collaborate and grow through proximity to the non-human animal is therefore similar to the, the pet in this respect through a temporary inhabiting of closeness and affiliation outside of structure, a duality is initiated and present, whereby the artist is both human animal and human observer, both within and beyond human conventions. Such a situation, therefore, allows for the potential recognition of the non-human animal with the same displaced self. If developed, this recognition can incite a fuller engagement with shared interspecies agency and the subsequent insights of the When offered collaborative interspecies artistic agency, the non-human animal gains capacity and awareness of their potential for creative and cognitive input. This relies on the human artists' willingness themselves to be animal, to approach non-human with equality in position and thinking and in being comfortable with shared acknowledgement and recognition of this role. Independently and as a grounding principle, this way of being is central to both our creative activities and as a collaborating duo. If humans can stop determining the unfolding of events or holding up or holding to objectives and performance and performative expectations, one of many key lessons animals teach us is how to abide within moments and within the sensory world more fully. When you do this, you often find them waiting for you in a liminal, emotional and intuitive space, which is where creativity arises and art making happens. This is through aliveness to the world, improvisation and the unexpected. Central to the methodology of both of us is the experiment with unknown outcome. Central also is the experience of the animal collaborator who heightens and deepens the work as participant, audience, an actor, um, protagonist, an actor, teacher, and enabler. This is enhanced by seeking out and inviting open-ended and voluntary ways for non-humans to participate. In such situations, it becomes possible to ask who in fact is the partner and collaborator, who invites and who participates. Is there a separation or coalition that is demonstrated in an enabling of the non-human as artistic? Can equality ever be fully realized even if this is a prioritized intention. An active acceptance of what animals, human and non-human will bring to the encounter is important and free participation with the animal's autonomy to refuse or leave at any time. We are interested in curiosity 
mutual and reciprocal, and not in artistic visions toward final product. An active, an active readiness for the unpredictable is necessary. The human artist accepts the animal and acts in turn as animal. This does not mean a refusal of the human or an absolute shift in stance toward animal. On the contrary, it is a declaration of the human as a human. An opportunity comes forth from such practice in which the invited non-human is an unfettered and full of human. Bartram and Digard recognize the feral, feral within ourselves and especially in our artistic engagement with those described as other. We individually and collaboratively look closely at what is different to normal constructs within human ways of being to sympathetically engage the eyes of the non-human animal, receiving their gazes, considering how they see, in order to represent a different way of looking and being looked at. We also examine the animal as distinct in personality from another, whose individuality informs a duality in which provides an effective vehicle for artists, stage ideas and methods in order to encourage engagement and reflection, communication with and to the audience. How and what one stages in the context of an exhibition is of importance. Artworks are selected and installed in response to each other as well as to overall curation. curation of subject. Some negotiations between artists concerning space and content can seem tricky. Successful collaboration is going to bring these respective needs into hoped for harmonious dialogue, into relationships of overlaps and proximities, even when the displayed artworks have been made individually. So this show in Utah, Draw, Breath, Animal, required a kind of collaborative contract, an informal mission statement between you know, the active human agents themselves, what to show and how, what best reflects process and duration and the various intimacies and allegiances involved. Retelling of artistic interspecies topographies, time <laughs> and duration require careful curatorial mapping and taking components in as like Hans Ulrich, Oberst reminds us in um, ways of curating that the Latin etymological, etymological root of curating is curare, to take care of. So our, our respective geographies, one of us in the UK and the other in the US, until we converged in Utah, have oh, you know, have always been shifted out of synchrony and distance is a logistical barrier. It alters means of connecting and shifts simultaneous understandings. And there are significant zones of unknowing. Of unknowing. Over, over long distances, communication develops nodes along overlapping wavelengths, and this opportunity was held within the purpose of the exhibition as a means of intent and intrinsic to the selection of artwork. The artists looked at we, we looked at previous artworks that collectively and intentionally bound us and had never been seen together in the space. So that, that explains the sort of mix of um, historic work you're seeing. Um, bodily engagement and mutual sensory emergent abilities of acts of companionship shared in otherwise uh, shared in, in artistic space. Bartram's Be Your Dog, a documentary video of a dog and human artistic pack formation within Karst, a gallery in Plymouth, UK, made collaboratively in 2016, explicitly invokes the engagement of bodies in concert and response and of the human following the animal's lead or its heightened empathetic acts. My project, um, Gus and Deuce Go Elsewhere from 2014, invites the curiosities and disproportionate considerations of horses, horses free entry into a museum, emphasizing their crucial autonomy and choosing to enter or not, and their horse-directed explorations of its contents towards their own enjoyment. 
Both projects sought to enhance the non-human within spaces given to culture and its implied human consumption, and to question anthropocentrism, the right of agency and the creative act in its reception. True collaborations have a mutualism and a sympathy, a buttressing in the partnering and combining of strengths and efforts. We, we want to embed and assertively engage with differences in order to heighten the possibilities and explorations. And as artists, we, we share an empathetic connection, both as humans working creatively together toward collaboration, through collaboration, but also by connecting through with sensibilities of non-human animals. So are, these become devotional practices within undefined outcomes, celebrating and working with them. The human participants remit within Bartram's be your dog was to be their be their dog. They were asked to follow without the positions their dogs adopted and to observe and mirror what they do with their bodies, following their interests and lines of vision. This was not because they shifted from one to the other, but an acknowledgement of both species as contiguous contribution in spite of and through their recognizable differences. The dogs were the leaders. They were the defining artists within the constructed pack. Knowing that some horses are curious about what is behind closed doors and other horses are not, my horses at the project in North Carolina several years ago was not about getting them inside a museum as a human spectacle, but to provide a potential spectacle for the horses in a horse guided, horse initiated art experience that prioritized the horse's emotional and physical well-being. The project began and was completely prepared to end as simply an invitation for the horses to look through an open door. And if they chose to enter, they were free to poke around at will and their interests and curiosity guided the exploration without cues or expectations or predetermined outcome. In the event, the horses stayed for more than two hours, touching and smelling, walking, hooves clopping, between rooms, standing at tables, examining installations and novel objects from my shelves to the floor. They had entered free as collaborators, as artists, and as viewers. The context, the site is important. Had either happened in a park or field, the dogs and horses have not naturally seen potentially as artists. The gallery and museum are crucial. A visitor assumes or potentially expects that perform the bodies and material things placed within the walls of artistic and intended acts. Because I'll, I'll talk a bit about proprioceptiveness and then skip to the end. Proprioceptiveness being mindful and responsive to sense sensing is keenly practiced by nearly all animals. It is necessary to survival. It is a beautifully tactful means of being thoughtfully and physically present with another. Those who are vulnerable employ it with additional burden. Um, during our lecture in Utah, another lecture in Kentucky, um, Elvira was a part of everything we did in Utah. Um, everything was reciprocal and went in two directions. And she um, stood with us in a lecture. She underlined pointedly and deliberately with her body the rhythms of the work itself. This being an explicit and expressive dialogue she conducted with her body. And so her presence heightened and delineated the exhibition of work that had invited the animal into the museum or the contemporary art gallery. Uh, she became a transmitter, like commissural fibers from brain receptors. But in this case, she held our shared brain with hers as a continuous. So much this relationship between trespass and invitation. Who may enter? If we enter with trepidation, even more so does the dog or the horse. We had permission for Elvira to be with us, which allowed her to be herself. 
and the system will take you to the of global spaces. Um, the critical effect, I'm skipping to the end, the critical effect is what inclusion can do. A showing of difference and of doing things differently enhances and contributes to the critical landscape and the development of pertinent and revolutionary questioning. Being open to and not presuming to know that we do becomes significant. So as artists, we are endeavoring to foreground the animal being freely themselves in all collaborative spaces. Sometimes um, project imagery may suggest to a human view humorous reading of an animal's action as a specific referendum on a project or novel object. All proximity to animals is inherently creative and generative, recognized by the artists as immense pleasures and an abiding privilege. Thank you so much for your time. I lost all track of time. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. That was so interesting. I'm stopping the recording button now.